Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to a second part of today's discussion and conversation. Um, we are talking about the start of the new, a new Islamic month. Um, obviously, uh, we are currently in Rajab and Sha'ban will start soon, inshallah. And when Sha'ban starts, then we will be leading into Ramadan. And after Ramadan, we will be in Shawwal. Now, I've been talking about how the new month starts, and I've been talking about the use of the hilal, the, the small kind of, you know, the kind of thin, ecliptical, really thin kind of cut that you see of the hilal, of the moon in the, on, in the sky, just after the birth of a new moon. It's the absolute, really thin crescent that you see. And that's the start for us when we cite it to start uh, either fasting or to uh, break the fast and celebrate Eid. And uh, this should obviously take place uh, around um, um, the, you know, when, we, when, when the night, when the day, when the uh, day is finished of the 29th, then we're supposed to go out onto these various places that I spoke about just before the part in uh, the short break that we had in part one, when they will go out to scour the skies to see if they can sight that moon. If they sight it, then that will mean that today was the last day of the month that's just finished. And tonight, because the night comes before day, is now the first. Okay, and it will be the first, and then obviously the day will follow. That will also be the first. If, however, people go out on the 29th night and they don't see anything, uh, so that will be, and then that will become the 30th night and therefore the next will be the 30th and then that night is automatically that this is going to be the start of the new month. There's no need to cite now because if you've had 29 days, it can only be 29 or 30 days. That's how normally the lunar cycle works. So when these months have been declared, then obviously we can proceed. But we were trying to understand where should Muslims be taking their citing from. So originally we said it's got to be based on what we call local sighting. Trying to sight those, the moon, like everybody else does, even though from the Hanafi perspective, we look at what's called global sighting, but this global sighting is not real global sighting, and I'll get to that in a bit. So we go by local sighting. Once you see locally, then obviously one would start the fast. However, there are numerous months, uh, unfortunately, where it cannot be sighted. So we have to borrow news from elsewhere. Preferably that news, you know, we would want to come from mainland Europe because it's geographically closer. So whether that be France, whether that be the Netherlands, whether that be, you know, any area literally just across the channel where if, that, if it could be sighted, then that would be fantastic because it could, we could borrow the news from there and proceed. But there are certain conditions about borrowing the news. Borrowing the news must be that it's coming from a particular place in which there is a Shari'i system in place. Meaning that there are brothers or sisters going out regularly to try to sight the moon. And once they sight the moon, they are then taking that to a Qadi. And then the Qadi is making a decision on that start of the new moon. And obviously then we're moving ahead with the start of fasting. And those particular brothers and sisters are fasting. And there's masajids and local Muslim communities acting upon that. Now we struggle to find that in most countries in mainland Europe, reason being is, Alhamdulillah, the UK is very much advanced in the religious services it provides for Muslims compared to these European countries. I have colleagues, students in uh, numerous uh, countries across mainland Europe, and they, you find that they're nearly you know, 30, 40 years behind where the UK is. So they've got a lot of, uh, so when it comes to the halal, they just don't have the capacity to be citing the hilal and have a kind of a judiciary system in place in order to make those declarations. Instead, what they try, what they do is they borrow the news. And where do they borrow the news from? Well, you find that most of these communities are, are kind of coming from different areas, um, from different, you know, either African countries or they're coming from Asian countries. And by some countries that have a very developed system, you find a lot of countries just lean towards the Saudi Arabia and they go by their declaration and they feel that just kind of works. So irrespective of which country they're landing, they just think it's just a central point. It's easy for people to focus on. You don't need to get clever. You don't need to have any systems in place, so you can just go by there. That doesn't mean that every country does that. You find many countries in Africa that have their own sighting. 
you also find, for example, many countries in Asia that have their own sighting. Um, it's just some countries choose because just for the sake of unity or for the fact that it just becomes a lot easier, less hassle, just to borrow that news from a central point. And you find a lot of mainland Europe are doing exactly the same thing. So the next thing then obviously is to go to a Muslim country which has its own independent declaration. The only country that we find which uh, it has its own independent declaration is Morocco. And that is, uh, you know, the closest Muslim country. It's an independent system. It has a very good system, in fact, uh, legislated system, in which the news is gathered from nearly 280 points. When that news is gathered from 280 points, it's brought back, centralised, uh, assessed, evaluated, and then the Ministry of uh, Hilal, the Ministry of kind of declaration of calendar dates, will make an announcement that now a new month has started. In fact, you'd find that the UK Muslims were following Morocco very when they first arrived on these shores. It was only in the kind of 19, mid 1980s or so that they decided to move from Morocco, and that was based on an event in which communication was slow. Go bear in mind, we were living in the time of fax machines. We weren't living in the time of WhatsApp. We weren't living in the time of fast communication, mobile communication. It just didn't exist. Emails were were hardly heard of. So therefore, communication was an old school, simplistic fax machine where a fax would come in and you would wait for that fax and then go collect that fax. And obviously, if you didn't have any paper in your fax machine, for some reason, if your line had been disconnected or anything else for that matter, because it was only one source and one point in which it entered the UK, it was, you know, unreliable at best. So there were times where the, those, and the system was such, communication was such, that there could be times, sometimes several hours between the announcement and that news reaching the UK shores, to such an extent where it could be, you know, three, four in the morning before news had reached the UK shores, that guess what, it is now Ramadan, and people had gone to sleep, not praying taraweeh, ready to get up in the next day, and now being told, quickly get up, make your suhoor, because it's going to be Ramadan. And similarly, for Eid al-Fitr, people would pray taraweeh because no news would come, they would go to sleep, and then it'd be so two or three in the morning when news would reach the UK shores, and it would be said, guess what, it's actually Eid, it's not Ramadan, so now obviously uh, people would think, goodness me, I was going to start my fast, but I don't need to, it didn't concern people too much, apart from the ladies who wanted to cook for Eid, for them now, they'd have to get up at two or three in the morning and make preparations for the next day. So this became a bit of a nuisance for people, and because it became a bit of a nuisance, they needed to seek alternative means. And the alternative means they sought was obviously Saudi Arabia. Why? Because people would go there either for Umrah, there would either be people working there, there would either be people based there. So it became nice and simple. All they would do is wait if uh, they didn't even need to have communications with the uh, uh, Darul Qadha, where the people were making declarations, all they would, they would do is see if there are taraweeh in Masjid al-Haram, then that clearly means Ramadan has started, and if there are no taraweeh, then that means Ramadan doesn't exist. Quick phone call back to the UK, and news could reach very early, because at the end of the day, uh, there was a, there's an, a, a time difference between Saudi Arabia and the UK, that they're ahead, so therefore news would reach here in ample time for people to either prepare for taraweeh, or obviously make preparation and not pray that we make preparation for Eid. And that became a system and that's the system which people used because they felt it circumvented the problem. It wasn't a case that it was a Shari decision in the sense that let's find the most suitable decision uh, place that we can go by from a Shari perspective. It was solely based upon ease of communication. And it seemed on the face of it that there was no harm in adopting that particular position. Why? Because people were using it, it's all good. It's only subsequently when analysis has been carried out, research has been carried out, particularly over the last sort of 30 years or so, it's been brought to attention that actually there seems to be a big problem with those announcements that are coming. Whether it be that people are kind of making announcements, there's, 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 a, there's, there's a desire, okay, there's a desire to try to make an announcement as early as possible and therefore, the, as long as the criteria, the criteria has changed over the years, but the criterion was, as long as the moon has been born, irrespective of its angle of elongation or anything other, any other sort of um, statistical data that is important in physical data rather than statistical data, physical data which is important to take into consideration in order to determine whether that's visible, possible to see or not.
And lately what we're seeing obviously is the use of CCD cameras. We also find that the system which the uh, uh, Saudis will use is pretty much based on their civil calendar, the Umm al Qura calendar, which has been put together for the purpose of civic issues. For instance, organizing flight times and days, or organizing scheduled events that take place through the year. Now, you cannot rely on the moon sighting, which is carried out by sighting itself, when you're trying to organize events. Because if I was to say to you, I'll see you here on the 3rd of Ramadan. Now, you don't know what that is because the 3rd of Ramadan is unknown to us. Why? We don't know when uh, Sha'ban is going to start. Sha'ban could start on a, one day or another day. It could be 29 days of Rajab or 30 days of Rajab. Then when Sha'ban starts, then Sha'ban itself could be 29 days of Rajab or 30 days of Rajab. Uh, so Sha'ban could be 29 days or 30 days. So it could potentially be that we could be out by two days. Um, in some cases, it might be the 4th or 5th Ramadan. In other cases, it could be the 3rd Ramadan. So we can't fix the time to meet on that particular day uh, in, in organizing things. So therefore, a civil calendar was produced and that was to be followed. But that was only to be followed on, uh, for civil issues, not for religious issues. So then the uh, Arab community in Saudi Arabia looked at when is it really important that one should follow uh, religious duties and when is it important to follow non you know is it when is it the months not as important so they realize it's really three maybe four key months muharram maybe dhul hijjah um, ramadan and uh, shawal where it was essential that the moon sighting declaration was made and the other months it wasn't that wasn't essential why was it essential because they didn't feel that they were of that religious significance as these four months were and therefore, there was leaning on the civic calendar, Umm al Qura calendar. And that's how things proceeded. But obviously, that's problematic because there's certain things. For example, Ayyami B, the three days that people uh, fast on, the bright lunar days. Uh, and that, you know, there was an issue there. Uh, when can you decide on them? And there's so many other religious matters as well, which are of significance to those. So there has been a push of late to reassess our original position that we adopted nearly, oh goodness me, 35 years ago now, um, in which it was decided that the switch would be made from Morocco to Saudi Arabia. That now is the time, you know, the, the issue of why we switched over in the first place is no longer an issue. Communication is fantastic. We're regularly receiving uh, faxes uh, or emails rather now. Um, there's direct contact. There's no, no concerns. It's not just coming to one party now. Several parties in the UK received that information so we're not relying on one literally within an hour or worst case two hours of sunset in Morocco the news has arrived so we're not having to wait long hours either and it's a reliable method it's a local method well is it local method well it's not local locally is in the UK only then what we're looking at is a regional method so this is what we call regional sighting which is we could arguably include Morocco or anything along the same uh, longitude we could include on there I touched upon global sighting, and some people argue, well, isn't uh, the Ahnaf's position so um, based on global sighting that wherever that sighting is made, that we should adopt that particular um, sighting? Well, the key issue that comes with there is that when this global sighting existed, particularly when this was discussed within the Hanafi Madhab, even though it's not considered as the Zahiri Riwayah, then it was based upon how fast a rider could travel or how far the sounds of um, cannons could be heard or the sight of fire because the means of transferring information from one district to another wasn't by fax or by phone or by WhatsApp or anything like that. It was based upon a rider, how fast a rider could ride uh, to get to another district to say that, guess what, the Hilal has been sighted in such and such district fast tomorrow. So we're really talking about maybe four, five hours, six hours, maybe at best 10, 12 hours. And it isn't as if that was a procedure that riders would ride out. It would just be if by chance a rider came. So, you know, even if a rider rides flat out for 10 hours, and, you know, he's doing whatever, 20 miles an hour, maybe even 30 miles an hour, let's say, then that's no more than 300 miles. That's not even the length of the UK. Um, so you can see that we're not talking about, when we say global, we're literally actually talking about local, okay? Because if, say, those people who go by local sighting, even if they saw sighting on Land's End, which is more than 300 miles away from where we are now, 
then they would accept that sighting, even though that, back in the day, was a definition of global sighting. So you can see this global is a misnomer, it's a misuse of the word global, global in the sense of a thousand years ago global, not global in our sense now where we can get on a plane literally, and we don't even need to get on a plane, we can just pick a phone up and we can ring the other side of the world instantaneously, like this, the way this program is right now being broadcasted, going on the internet, anybody, anywhere who can access the internet can view this. So it's literally as the words are leaving my lips that you are hearing them, you know, literally talking split seconds, if anything. So that shows now news can, so we, we can't use global as we define it now, which is real global, as to what it was over a thousand years ago when global was limited by the travel of sound, when global was limited by the, the visual sighting of something, or it was determined by a rider getting the information across to a particular people. So that, hence the reason why global is not accurate. So when we're going by a country all the way across thousands of miles away in Saudi Arabia, then even though people might say, actually, but aren't we a glo community that goes by global sighting? This is way beyond our particular geographical jurisdiction, you could argue. If, for example, that was the case that the Ahnaf position is to adopt global sighting, then you would see that being adopted in Pakistan and in India. In fact, Pakistan has its own sighting system in place in which it declares it for its own country rather than relying on Saudi Arabia, which is not too far away. So we can see that, you know, the sighting itself is clearly limiting itself to Morocco at best uh, and, and therefore that makes things a lot easier. That's just the sighting, okay? Nowadays, unfortunately, we don't even care for the declaration. We just switch on the TV and if we see people making taraweeh, we'll just say, okay, tomorrow is Ramadan. And likewise, we switch there on the TV at the end of the month, and if people aren't praying through, we will say, oh, I see you tomorrow. We don't care whether there's a declaration or no declaration. That is not sound practice. The starting of the month of Ramadan, or any month for that matter, and the finishing of that is a legal uh, uh, matter. It's not a non-legal matter. It has to be declared, okay? Not that people will say, so for example, let's just say, I know this is not possible, but let's just say that the R value, okay, was made available to everybody for, due to this COVID-19 and we're looking at the R value that we need to drop the R value so the spread of the viruses slow down. And let's just say the government said that if the R value reaches 0.5, we'll make a declaration and all um, so limitations will be lifted. And let's just say in every house the R value was up on a wall somewhere like a clock. And if, let's just say, we saw the R value drop to 0.5, we can't now go out and say, ah, oh, fantastic, let's celebrate. All the, all the restrictions and limitations have been lifted. No, because the government hasn't made a declaration yet. They said, once the R value is 0.5, we will make a declaration. Up until that time they've made that declaration, it is still illegal to do the things which the country has made illegal due to COVID, even though the condition has been met. This is exactly the same way when someone's switching their TV on and saying, ah, we can see people praying in the haram, therefore Eid al-Fitr has, uh, uh, sorry, Ramadan has started. It isn't. If that, even though if that, this is even for those people who follow that condition, they would have to wait for that declaration. That is absolutely essential. So this declaration takes into kind of a legal sphere. And in the legal sphere, we understand that obviously this is to do with the Sharia. Yani there has to be a Qadi, there has to be a judge. A judge has to make a declaration or a group of judges has to make a declaration that the new month has started. So there has to be a legal system for that. It's not just switching a TV on and making a decision. So that legal system has to be in place, whether that be in Morocco or Saudi Arabia or anywhere else for that matter. Another thing that we have to be careful about is to ensure that we're not being necessarily duped into thinking that what is being shown to us is the sighting of the moon when most of, the, unfortunately, what we're getting from Saudi Arabia in particular is CCD imagery. Now, CCD imagery is not actually the sighting of the moon. It's the use of light, use of light rather, uh, to reflect off the object in such a way as to produce an image. So it's producing an image. It's not, it's not giving you the image. It's not an, uh, telling you that's what it is. It's, a, it's producing an image. And therefore, we can't go with that because that doesn't come under the criterion of ru'ya. So that's important to understand. So we've talked about the ru'ya where it is based, how, how do we go about it. We've talked about localised, we've talked about regional, and we've talked about global, and how we shouldn't misunderstand it to mean that the Hanafi Madhab is, accepts that particular position. So we've got all of that side. Similarly, we've talked in great detail here about 
the legal system that has to be in place, how that news reaches. It cannot be that we just get it through watching the TV or anything that before a decision has been made. Once a decision has been made, then it's open to how that news can spread. But a decision has to be made first. Again, we should be tempered in thinking that this is just free distribution of, of information because we know back in the day this information did not spread so vastly uh, because obviously there was no way of spreading it that vastly. It was based upon um, either transport, you know, some form of transportation carrying the information or something which could be cast far, like the cannons or the fire or anything. So again, these are essential points that we need to understand. And it's important, as Muslims, we, we look at that. So we should, you know, to educate our children, to educate ourselves, regularly be looking at, you know, when is it that the uh, uh, new month has started? When is it finishing? You know, what are the months of the year? This is all about our identity, and if we don't take our identity seriously, then unfortunately what's going to happen is our children are going to grow up and they're not going to know anything about how Ramadan starts or how it finishes. And slowly we will continue to lose our key identifiers of our faith until obviously we're left with hardly anything and we can't even recall you know, the Shahada, unfortunately. This, you know, ilm is going to go slowly. It's not going to go all in one go. So that which ilm, which only certain key asp uh, experts have, that will go first. So when it comes to mirath, inheritance issues, then we know that that is a quite a skilled expert area and very few ulama work in that area of inheritance. So whenever we have an inheritance question, we have to seek out those scholars who deal with inheritance matters so that they can respond for us. But once those uh, scholars uh, you know, disappear off the face of the earth, pass away, die, and we don't have any other scholars continuing to preach and teach inheritance, then that part of the mother, that part of the deen will disappear until there will be no such thing as mirath because everybody would have forgotten how to work, calculate it. They wouldn't know uh, what fractions to use. They wouldn't know uh, what decimals to use. They wouldn't know what share goes to the wife, what share goes to the uh, children, what share goes to the son, what share goes to the daughter, what share goes to the mother, what if the man and the wife don't have children, what share should you get, how much can you get and bequest, all these sorts of things will disappear. And then unfortunately we'll start to lose other aspects of deen, like things like, you know, when, you know, what are the names of the months in Islam, uh, how does a new month start. We have to continue to, you know, advocate and educate in order for us and our children to be well aware of it. So it's important that we have a system. It's important that we follow it all year round and it's important that we understand how the process is working. And, you know, we need to educate ourselves. We need to know more about how we start our months and how we finish our months. We don't want to uh, uh, sort of kind of live in oblivion and, and, and not be aware of these sorts of things and then unfortunately get stuck afterwards and, you know, kind of argue, well, you know, we couldn't work this out. We don't know what we're doing. So... Key, key information there. So that's the, that's the Hilal, that's how the month will start. Obviously, that you'll get first experience of this, so maybe that'll be useful to have. The first experience of this will be, obviously, with the start of Sha'ban, which is due to start in, whatever, nearly a couple of weeks' time now. And that, you know, how does that start? And that's important as well. Why, why is that important? Why do we need to know? Because we have the 15th of Sha'ban there. Now, I appreciate uh, the Ahadith are weak in that area. Uh, however, there is some significance to, to the day. Uh, and, you know, we should look at that significance. The fasting itself, you know, it does fall on the Ayyami Bid. We shouldn't specifically fast on that day. Similarly, we see the Prophet of Allah Wasallam used to fast quite a number of days within the month of Sha'ban. So we should try to fast as much as possible, not isolate the 15th. But the night of the 15th, there seems to be some specific uh, encouragement towards uh, doing acts of worship on that particular night. That does seem to have been uh, drawn out and for, with distinction. So that's something we can look at. And then as we move towards Ramadan, you know, we can keep an eye on how is this going to be declared, how is this going to happen and whatever. And then obviously make good use. Once the Ramadan has started, then make good use of it. It is not our argument as such to, to debate with scholars and sort of say, well, you know, this is wrong, that is right. Once it started, it's done now. There's no point now arguing. This is why I'm saying is you, we should be involved in the conversation, in the discussion right from uh, the word go as in as soon as the Sha'ban is over, uh, sorry, as soon as Shawal is over and the Ramadan is behind us, like I said, we'll forget. 
we just move on to the next thing and we have no concerns about the start of the new month anymore. It was just, that was topical at the time. It was interesting, we had lots of conversations, you know, had a go at the ulama as usual, blame them for the social ills and the end of society and then carry on with what's, you know, what's for supper. Unfortunately, that seems to be the uh, regular occurrence year in, year out. So these are, you know, in, in, important things, as I said, that we've got to be aware of as to how it starts. Once, as I said, but once it started, really focus on the ritual acts and try your best to get as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible. In terms of starting, when does, you know, when should we make suhoor, when shouldn't we make suhoor, how does that work? Is that also based on Saudi Arabia? Well, no, that's not based on Saudi Arabia whatsoever. That's based on the movement of the sun, okay? Uh, how the sun, for example, we're pretty sure what sunrise is, we're pretty sure what sunset is, there's no doubt about that, and we're pretty sure what noon is. We have clear clarity from astronomical data that's provided to us by the HMNAO, and we can see that, yep, okay, this is the time that the day starts, this is the time the day ends, and this is the time when it's in the middle of the day. What we don't have clarity on, or where the confusion does come for some people, is when does Isha time start? This is obviously with the disappearance of what's called the Shafak, the twilight. Which twilight is it? And when does that happen? What astronomical um, phenomenon can we relate that to? And then on the other side, and that's why you find people praying Isha at different times. Some people pray Isha 10, some 10.30, some 11, some even later than that. And then the other end of it is when does the actual suhu take place? When does the dawn take place? Okay, uh, when is it now true dawn, not false dawn? And that also very like we see, discussed with the shafak. That's also there's some uncertainty or lack of clarity there for some people. And as a result, they have different times, and that's why you see all these different times in suhu. So, but I think that is a topic for another day. Uh, we have covered, I think, in somewhat great detail of how we start the months of uh, the year and obviously, as a consequence, the month of Ramadan. And I just touched upon the differences that we have in our Salah times and how that comes about. I will, inshallah, in tomorrow's uh, episode, talk in great detail about this Salah times and how that has come about, inshallah so that people become, can become full, fully aware. Again, once you have a position that you're following a particular scholar, remember you can't reach a position yourself, you're ill-equipped to do so, you're unqualified to do so. Once you have adopted a position by a scholar you trust and you recognize, at that particular time, that is the position that, one, that you should adopt. And then don't be too concerned about anything else. Now is the time to do your research, not when Ramadan starts. Then when Ramadan starts, now stick to the suhu times you have, stick to the Isha times you have and see the month through. That's not the time now for debate and discussion. This is your shaitan sidetracking away from the actual purpose of Ramadan, which is self-reflection, uh, sacrifice, fasting and other acts of worship. But whilst we're leading up to it, the couple of weeks we get, we've got left of Rajab, uh, the full month of Ramadan, uh, sorry, the full month of Sha'ban rather, then that is sufficient time for you to now assess where your lunar position is, you know, the ulama that you trust. Why are they on that? You can question them. That's this, absolutely fine. Can you just supply me evidence, information, why you adopt this position? And secondly, what time are we going to be making suhoor? And what time are we going to be making Isha? And on what basis is that? Now is the time to do it. Hence the reason why I'm raising it now, not during the month of Ramadan. So please do join me again tomorrow, inshallah, in which I will explore this area of uh, Salah times in more detail. In particular, obviously, is the Isha time, because that will be the time of Taraweeh, and the Suhoor time, because that will be the time when we cease to eat, and Fajr will start. So join me, inshallah. Uh, we, but it will also be open for Q&A, so you can also call in with any other questions as well, and I will see you tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.